Hi everyone, Tony here. Today we're gonna have a guest from another continent. This means that both me um, in Brazil and our guest in Australia will be freezing because right now in July it's, uh, it's winter. Um, uh, you probably know him uh, from his uh, jovial or angry uh, LinkedIn post um, if you are an email professional. Uh, his name is Luke Raven. He is uh, MLRO at Capital, and uh, I would invite uh, Luke to, to introduce himself uh, in more detail because obviously he knows better than me his uh, own experience. <laughs> Thanks, Tony. Um, yeah, I'm Luke Raven. I'm a very passionate uh, financial crime professional or anti-financial crime professional, I suppose. Um, I've been doing anti-financial crime in one way or another for 13 years now. Um, worked for a variety of fintechs and uh, big four Australian banks, so I've sort of seen both sides. And yeah, very passionate about the fight for um, fight against financial crime, I should say. And you are an MLRO at the crypto business right now, right? So it's crypto investment firm? Yes, it's called Capital Crypto Without the Crazy. Like briefly, what do you think is like the main specific character characteristics, let's say, of being an ML uh, professional at the crypto business instead of, let's say, being on the fiat side. Yeah, I mean, I th there's a lot of fundamental similarities, right? Um, you're still trying to find bad guys at the end of the day and protect your firm from regulatory issues. Uh, I think that when you talk about crypto specifically, it's, it's basically just another form of fintech. Um, and the differences between fintechs and banks are really interesting because each of them kind of has the strengths and weaknesses that, that um, directly correlate to the other. So uh, fintechs have to make do with less personnel than banks. Um, and so as a way of doing that, they, they make each of their um, analysts and each of their actual boots on the ground sort of count for 10, 20, 100 um, normal sort of staff because they use technology as a force amplifier. And what they don't have is just an army of people to throw at every problem. Banks, on the other hand, it's kind of the opposite. Um, they, they don't have that technology driven approach as much because they're largely built on, you know, hundreds of years of infrastructure that's been sort of built over time and, and isn't necessarily that easy to change. So they do have uh, the resources. So in a crypto firm, you really have to be similar to any fintech. You really have to be um, responsive and, and very focused on making technology stretch your resources to make sure that you can manage your risks. I think that's probably the most important thing um, at any fintech, uh, whether crypto or otherwise, is, is really understanding that that technology um, is there to uh, assist you and how you can make sure that you're still meeting and sometimes exceeding um, in terms of your regulatory and, and financial crime mitigation strategies, uh, even though you may not have the, you know, thousands and thousands of staff. There is a stereotype, uh, maybe it's a wrong stereotype, but there is a stereotype that crypto businesses, crypto exchanges, they have a, a let's say, a more relaxed approach towards risk uh, management uh, procedures and that they can onboard, let's say, people that banks would probably not onboard. Um, is it true, false, is it a myth? I don't think it's a myth. Look, I only have the experience at the one crypto firm. It's certainly not the case for us. But I think that as an industry, we've kind of earned that reputation because of where we came from. So we've grown very rapidly over, say, 10 years. And it was essentially started out as, uh, I would term it, the Wild West. And the crypto exchanges were kind of like the cowboys playing fast and loose. Um, that's So it's kind of an earned reputation. But now, uh, as, as the crypto market matures, as it sort of approaches more mainstream adoption, we have mature businesses like ours, like other, other larger um, crypto firms entering the space and sort of starting to essentially be the adults in the room. And <laughs> so if you look at, for instance, us, um, as opposed to some of those early crypto exchanges, we have, you know, our senior management has a really strong background in financial services. Um, our compliance is, you know, from the get go being prioritized, as opposed to sort of tacked on later as regulation catches up. So I don't think it's an entirely undeserved stereotype, but it's one that we're moving away from as the industry matures. Just a question in furtherance to that, because uh, I just read um, uh, one of the recent materials uh, describing different uh, approaches as to verification of onboarding of different crypto exchanges. I'm not talking about your exchange, but let's say, for example, FTX and KuCoin, um, they are 
described in this material as exchanges that can actually admit users, um, let's say halfway, uh, to, uh, even to, to, to fiat withdrawals, uh, even uh, like what is typical, for example, okay, they, they have a verification of email, uh, and let's say maybe the ver verification of ID, but not definitely proof of address. And so the, the person can get into some operations without getting the uh, proof address. I'm not saying something against these exchanges, probably we will talk with them later on. And, and of course they have probably some reasons for that uh, approach. It's risk-based approach after all, but what do you think about this, uh, this way of um, onboarding? Obviously, bank wouldn't do this. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm quite lucky in that uh, this isn't permitted under Australian law in the first place. So it's very explicit. You have to do KYC up front. But I'm, I'm familiar with the approach taken in other jurisdictions where I believe it is actually permitted under the law. Just because something's permitted under the law doesn't mean necessarily it's the best way to go. And so my answer to this question is I, I don't see how you would be able to get comfortable with, with this kind of approach because essentially you're accepting risks that you're yet to fully understand. How can you have a risk-based approach if you haven't actually done the foundational work to understand where your risks are? Um, so that, that's my, my sort of answer to this. Usually it's based on like a threshold as well, uh, and which sounds great from a, when you talk about like transnational organized crime, if it's a thousand threshold, you sort of say, well, what's the harm that can happen? Actually, there's significant harm that can happen at that sub $1,000 level. Um, things that are, that are very, very damaging to society, such as child exploitation, terrorism, they, they terrorism funding rather, um, they, they tend to happen in this transaction range, uh, or they certainly can. And being blind to those risks or accepting those risks blindly, I should say, um, that, that to me, that really rubs me the wrong way. I, I wouldn't personally be comfortable with that. But as you say, it is a risk-based approach that different firms have different risk appetites. What about, let's say, uh, going, going uh, further to another uh, procedure, which is what is called the sim simplified due diligence procedures. Uh, I know that uh, that some of the uh, some of the ML professionals they actually are afraid of uh, applying this because this means that you need to explain to yourself and to uh, your bosses and to the regulator why you apply the simplified due diligence to this category of customers. Do you apply uh, simplified due diligence uh, in your in your case? Yeah. Look, I think that people need not be afraid of it. If it's permitted under legislation, you are foolish not to take advantage of it. The counterpoint I would say to those people that are worried about it is if you're spending all of your resources not taking advantage of simplified due diligence when you're able to, what you're doing is squandering resources that could be better uh, spent identifying risks elsewhere. Um, simplified due diligence doesn't mean that you're sort of blind to the risks. In, in Australia, for instance, simplified due diligence applies in fairly specific um, sort of situations, such as you're listed on the stock exchange or you're a holder of like an Australian credit license or an Australian financial services license. The rationale, I think, for simplified due diligence in these situations is that actually like identifying who owns an entity that's listed, for instance, is just going to be an exercise in frustration and in futility. You're never going to be able to find it because shares are trading every single day, changing hands. Uh, so what you find at like when you begin the KYC process won't be true an hour later for a listed company. And that's why simplified due diligence exists, is you don't necessarily need to drill down. But you can still manage your risks. You can say, we're gonna apply simplified due diligence in respect of who the beneficial owners are, but we still need to make sure that who's representing the company is authorized to represent the company. We're still gonna mitigate specific risks like, oh, this is a mining exploration company. Okay, where do they mine? Is there sanctions concerns? Is there human rights concerns? There's these other questions. So simplified due diligence doesn't mean it's just sort of like blind to the risk one and done. It's, it's, just, it's just making sure that you concentrate your efforts where they're actually needed and, and beneficial. So yeah, that's, I, would, I would strongly advise people to take advantage of simplified due diligence and have a process and a policy for it. In life, uh, it's important to keep things in balance. Work, personal life, meeting with your friends, or spending time home with the family, eating good healthy food, or treating yourself occasionally with a burger. When you are a company, you understand how difficult it is sometimes to uh, balance everything. And we at SumSub will help you to balance three things, regulatory compliance, 
fraud protection and good pass rates. Now, if you are a crypto business, I have even better news for you. Uh, my team and some sub product experts have prepared a complete guide how to stay compliant in the industry. These insights are based on our experience, years experience working with crypto companies, and will show you how to build the perfect workflow. Download our KYC guide by clicking the link in the description. Thank you. What about, let's say, such measures as, um, as uh, I mean, even enhanced due diligence as, for example, verification of source of wealth, um, a source of funds, source of wealth, uh, do, you, do you apply them? Yes, of course. We, we, the, the thing with source of wealth and source of funds is it's interesting because they're supposed to be something that gives you real um, confidence around dealing with that customer and especially with a high risk customer where, where they're getting it from. So when you collect source of wealth and source of funds, it is irrelevant to sort of do it as a checkbox exercise and say, oh, hi, welcome to my financial institution. Where did you get your funds from? Tick a box that says inheritance. And you go, okay, great. That's, that's not really satisfying anything other than checkbox compliance, which I hate. Um, so yeah, we, we definitely do do source of wealth and source of funds checks. Um, it depends on the scenario which is required um, and the the tip i would offer anybody that's sort of looking to do this is you can rely on the customer um, for, for some of this stuff for instance to provide you bank statements or, or a reasonable explanation as to why someone that's 20 years old has three million dollars or something along those lines but also you can corroborate this stuff with uh, open source intelligence sometimes especially with respect to peps a lot of the time their wealth their sort their you know shareholdings their income is a matter of public record. So you can actually have a high degree of confidence because it's a government source um, and actually go and track that down independently. And that way, when they say, oh, this is my income, you say, well, actually that makes sense. That fits what we know about the customer's profile because we can actually verify that ourselves. In terms of, um, let's say, jurisdictional um, risk factors, uh, I mean, obviously, uh, in each risk matrix, you have, let's say, a long list of countries with, uh, let's say, different uh, different uh, colors, uh, depend depending on the level of risks. Usually, it's, uh, it's four categories. Yeah, the traffic light system. Traffic light system, yeah, exactly. Some of the risk matrices, they actually have four uh, levels of, of risk, which is like, low, middle, high, and then refer to the MLRO, <laughs> which means no way. <laughs> and actually, in, in, terms of, in terms of countries, sometimes I see that this refer to MLRO, which is like, no way we can, we can, uh, we can like, onboard this person. Um, it, it actually, in terms of jurisdictions, it's like maybe like 30 jurisdictions all around the world. It's like a lot of jurisdictions sometimes. What's, what is your case? Um, how many countries do you block how many countries are in, let's say, refer to MLRO zone? Um, how do you affirm it? How do you, how do you how do you determine this in general? Well, so how we determine country risk is uh, we we um, actually source it. <laughs> we we source it from a very well renowned vendor, and we also apply our own intelligence to it uh, on top of that. So we get the base product, and then we enhance it to make sure that we're we're happy with where it's at. So just because a vendor says you know X country is medium risk, we may say actually we we've seen. Um, you know, more scams in that country, for instance. It's as similar as like using um, Transparency International or any of these things as a starting point, but, but we don't, it's not the final point. But I think one thing with how firms approach this differently is when you talk about a risk-based approach, one thing that no one can really know is the strength of their internal control environment. So maybe their MLRO is, you know, overly conservative, or maybe their MLRO has conducted a risk assessment and a controls assessment and said, well, actually we, we have no way of mitigating these risks. For us, we are really hesitant to sort of block off any country that we don't absolutely have to. So there's basically three, um, three categories of country that we won't deal with or citizens of countries that we just won't deal with. The sanctioned countries, the big six, um, and that's, that's the main ones um, that are from a financial crime risk perspective. But the other two um, types of country that we won't deal with uh, or 
people in that country that we won't deal with, I should say, are A, when those people would be breaking the laws of that country by dealing in crypto, because there's a few countries which have actually outlawed crypto, and we don't want to facilitate anyone to break the law. So although we do believe that, you know, democratization of financial services is a noble goal, we're not going to be we're not going to be allowing people to break the law and access crypto in spite of their local regulations. So that's that's an important caveat as well. And then the last one is actually when we would be breaking the law or we would be at least uncomfortable um, by offering services in that market without a license that we don't have. So for instance, there's, there's um, gated areas of the world that we won't enter and we won't entertain clients from those areas yet, but we will in time once we have the license. So this means that, for example, I, I, I remember that China, for example. Ch China is a country we won't we won't deal with with Chinese um, nationals because we believe that there's a high chance that that would be representing an illegal activity. So we don't we don't want to facilitate that. A nationals or residents, both. Both. Okay. Uh, when, when it comes to, for example, let's say gray list, uh, five gray list countries uh, that we have right now, they're, they're much larger. It's a more larger list than just six countries, obviously. Although most of the big six are on the list sometimes, yes. uh, or at least most of them. Do you take this into account? It, it flows through into our assessment, but we don't make blanket. You know, Fat FATF is wonderful, um, but at the same time, they, they don't make our internal policy. We, we are influenced by that, but we are not, you know, beholden to it. So similar to anyone with dealings with um, entities in a grey listed area, it means enhanced due diligence essentially. So just like um, on, the, on the traffic light system that you described before with customers and jurisdiction risk rating, um, just because something's red doesn't mean you can't proceed, it means proceed with caution, uh, with, with appropriate due diligence. So that's, that's how we treat the grey listed countries. We don't blanket ban them, um, anyone in them. The other thing is, is just because someone's affiliated with those uh, or comes from that place doesn't mean that we can't apply our own standards. It, it more means that you shouldn't necessarily rely on, well, my interpretation of it at least, is any due diligence that's been done before is, is potentially suspect from other institutions. But we're not in a space where we're relying on that, like in a correspondent banking relationship. Um, so so it, it is less relevant for us. We can still conduct our own due diligence. We can still make sure that, for instance, if it's easy to forge an identity in that um, jurisdiction, that we go above and beyond in terms of verifying the actual customer. Um, so there's all sorts of approaches we can take. It depends. Um, the, the reasons for people being, uh, jurisdictions being grey listed are, are many and various, right? So it, it really depends as well on the specific risks that present. It, a lot of the time it's for secrecy and, and, and ta you know, tax secrecy and, and things along those lines as well. They, they are the jurisdictions that tend to end up being grey listed sometimes. Um, and there's, a, there's ways to mitigate that as well is um, we make sure that we're, we're insisting on full transparency. And if you don't like it, then unfortunately there's the door. About Australia in general, um, so you are obviously the, the expert uh, about Australian market. Is there money laundering in Australia? Yes, <laughs> there's a lot of money laundering in Australia, unfortunately, yes. More, more than, let's say, in Brazil? Uh, I may defer to you on the <laughs> Brazil market. Um, I think it's different. Um, look, it's a, it, that's, that's a tough one to say. Um, we are a destination of choice for money launderers because we are in APAC in Australasia. We're a, a, a well-regarded market. So immediately when you get your funds into Australia, they're regarded with less suspicion um, you know, by, by external parties. So I, I think that we're a, definitely a target for money launderers. Uh, we have some deficiencies as well in our programs, um, in, our, in our legislative framework, I should say, uh, for instance, not having implemented sufficiently some of the FATF recommendations, which kind of leave us open. Um, and we also have, I would say, uh, a bit of a problem in Australia in that we're a wealthy country with high disposable income. And with that comes a lot of crime. Uh, we, we have a lot of demand, the demand side for crime and therefore money laundering, um, the proceeds of that crime is actually high right here at home. According to Transparency International, uh, uh, Australia is uh, considered as one of the five main uh, enablers of world corruption and money laundering. 
At the same time, we know that Australia is one of the largest, uh, the civil, like most civilized, most developed um, countries in the region, in the what is called the Austral Australasia region. Um, and so, how this correlates to each other? How it's happening that at the sort of one at the same time, Australia is one of the most civilized, developed countries if we exclude the non-face-to-face verification procedures. And at the same time, at the same time, uh, is uh, one of the main enablers of uh, money laundering. It's a fair question. I think I would call out that generally strong economies are going to attract um, illicit activity because of that perception that you get when you wash money through a strong economy, right? Um, the same things that make Australian bank accounts really great for legitimate businesses also make it really good for organized crime groups and, and that sort of thing. Um, in the in that, you know, your money's not going to disappear. It's very stable. Um, it's quite trusted if it originates in Australia or appears to originate in Australia. So there's benefits uh, to, to, you know, laundering in Australia. Um, also, we have a large number of predicate offences that happen here, so you know it's easier to launder funds in the in the jurisdiction where the crime was committed, um, at least initially. Of course, there's some things that we need to improve. There's chinks in the armour, I would say. We're laggards in regards to two really important um, FATF recommendations. Those being the recommendation to uh, regulate our gatekeeper professions. So. In Australia, your real estate agent, your lawyer, your uh, company formation agent, your accountant, these people, even though they're very peripheral to a lot of financial crime, they don't have the same sort of obligations that they do in other parts of the world where they are also captured by AML laws and need to sort of let the regulator and the FIU know if there's something sus going on. They don't have that obligation. So that's one major issue. Um, the other one is that we don't have a, um, a beneficial ownership registry. This is kind of like a quirk of Australia. Um, for companies, we have a searchable database where you can find who owns things, but it costs money to actually access who owns what. Um, and this is for specifically for company type um, business vehicles. Whereas we also have this large number, um, Australians have like a, an obsession with, with trusts. So when I speak to someone um, overseas, they sort of say, oh, well, you know, when a trust is going to be relevant, they're, they're, they're rare. But no, in Australia, everyone's got a trust, uh, you know. Like everyone. It's, it's very, very rare <laughs> that businesses, you know, very common that businesses actually have trusts. And th these are... They, there's no central repository for information about beneficial ownership because it's all offline. It's contained in a document and it's potentially that document was, you know, older than me. And so you actually are reliant on the customer providing you this information and it, it may be really difficult for them to get or... Is it, this registration document on trust, for example, um, the, or trust document, trust deed or something? Yeah, deed, a deed. Yeah, is it, is it certified by someone or we would like you and me can just uh, draft a trust deed and uh, with our two signatures, it will be fully valid. Okay. Well, look, uh, whether or not it has force of law is one question, but but in terms of creating a document that has the appearance of a legitimate document, it's absolutely easy, that easy, yes. yes. Ordinarily, you have a lawyer or an accountant assist you with setting up a trust deed um, and, and creating that trust. There's, there's several issues, even with a legitimate trust, uh, that are very opaque. You can't necessarily understand who owns Ownership is, as a concept, doesn't really apply to trust. It's more about control. Um, but of course, the people that are going to receive the, the benefit of the trust, they're, they're where the risk resides, right? And that's very difficult to tell, even with a legitimate trust. But going back to your question about certification, certification in Australia is uh, a process where you go into sort of like a pressed pharmacist at 11 p. You know, a.m. And, and they're sort of busy. And you say, hey, can you please um, certify that this document and this copy are the same thing? They don't actually go through and make sure that the veracity of that information is, is correct. So there's so many shortfalls you could take advantage of. For instance, you could set up a trust on Monday completely validly. You could go into the bank with the lawyer that set it up and everything. You could establish your account, okay? Say, say that it's perfect verification. You understand everyone involved in that trust. 
the account is opened, on Tuesday, you go to the lawyer and say, I want to make an update. Now I want all of these terrorists to be beneficiaries and I want the, you know, the trustee to be this um, high risk offshore entity, rah, rah, rah. That, that, that's not going to be visible to anybody. That's, that all happens in a, in a document that then sits in that lawyer or the accountant's file cabinet or in your storage um, area. So that, that non, you know, that offline type um, document, the, those businesses, they're, they're very, very difficult and they present a really, really... It's completely blind. It looks, looks completely blind, yeah. Correct, correct, yes. And, and then the last thing on Transparency International is we're... we're um, this isn't a specific thing about FATF, but um, it is politically uh, very interesting. We, we don't have a federal anti-corruption um, body. We, we don't have one. And it looks like we're going to get one under the new government that's just come in. But this has been an outstanding question for 10 plus years. Where, where is it? Um, because we have them at a state level and they're actually quite good at a state level at drawing out um, corruption and corrupt conduct. But of course, federally is where the big money is at. This is where we really need this, this sort of anti-corruption commission. We don't have it. So I think that you know, Transparency International calling us one of the major enablers of, um, of money laundering, it, it, it's, not, it's not far from the mark because we, we're missing some of the structure that we need to really combat that. And it, it looks like it is coming politically, but it's coming, it's coming far too slowly, unfortunately. We, we've needed it for 10 years. From your standpoint, which countries probably would be the typical, um, let's say, originators of uh, dirty money uh, that are ending up in Australia? I'll be a bit cheeky with this one. I think Australia is a big um, originator of the dirty money that's laundered in Australia, um, because we we have you know a lot of a lot of crimes that, that take place here. Um, however, you know, in the spirit of your question, like for international funds flows, that they largely sort of mirror the realities of our major trade partners, so countries like China, US, UK, um, but also our geographic location. So basically all of Southeast Asia. And the reason for this is that synergies exist um, for legitimate business. It might be you know, really profitable to import ceramics from Southeast Asia or certain countries or whatever. Those same routes are still the same ones where you know, money and uh, you know, for, for instance, drugs or you know, even, even worse, people, the, these things can be smuggled by the same routes. So those same synergies exist. So it tends to closely mirror our, um, our trade partners. What are, let's say, the main, let's say, ways, or I don't know, the, the typical caravans that are um, that are bringing uh, dirty money into Australia? Well, yeah, I'll, I'll probably the the most interesting way that money is laundered in Australia is through real estate. Um, so I think it was in sort of popularized in Canada. I think they call it the Vancouver method or something like that. But but we've we've certainly had a crack at perfecting it as well. Um, we've been in the midst of this sort of historical housing boom for a very long time. So it's been a really, really lucrative and safe investment for people to put dirty money into property. So that's one of the major ways. Um, but avoiding those gatekeeper professions, because of course that, that largely relies on lawyers, accountants and real estate agents still. So apart from the gatekeeper professions, though, there's other really unique uh, vulnerabilities in Australia because of how we are and where we are. So we're a big island, basically in the middle of nowhere, um, and we have a lot of trade partners and a lot of international remittance that is that is genuine. Um, and so that opens us up to a couple of really interesting uh, money laundering techniques that apply everywhere in the world, don't get me wrong, but they're especially prevalent in Australia. One of them is trade-based money laundering because we have so much international trade. Um, the other one that I think is very interesting and really difficult to combat as well is uh, something called cuckoo smurfing, where you basically write on the back of legitimate transactions through um, alternative remittance means, you know, your Hawala dealers or your remitters, um, and you actually replace the funds at both ends <laughs> so as to effect a, a criminal transfer that looks like a legitimate transfer. Um, and the problem with this is that essentially um, it's, it's kind of like a, a technique that uses a mule or an un, unwitting smurf um, because the person doesn't realize that the funds that they were expecting to receive um, from you know, a, a relative overseas or send to a relative overseas have been diverted. And so from their perspective, they have just affected a, a transfer completely legitimately. And what's actually happened is, is they've aided in, um, in laundering funds and moving money around for criminal groups. 
So these are the, the major sort of interesting ways that money is laundered in Australia. Um, none of them are uniquely Australian in that they don't apply elsewhere, but it's uniquely Australian, the scope and, and, and size of the issue, I would say. Is uh, crypto business uh, really involved in, in, this, uh, in this money laundering happening in Australia? How do you think? Yeah, I think... Is it already there? Yeah, absolutely. Look, um, crypto is used for money laundering. It's not especially great for it as a standalone though it's not like it's uh, uh, it's just part of the process so the things that make crypto interesting for money launderers are the instantaneous transfers across the world and hopping the funds and and so, sort of the pseudonymity of um of the addresses um especially when you start to consider things like unregulated exchanges or DeFi markets and that sort of thing or self-custodial cold wallets all of this stuff so it's not to say that it's not happening it absolutely is but i don't think that it's you know used at scale for major operations and when it is it's not the only thing that's used it's not like um it's not like that's that's the method of choice it's just another it's just another brick in the in the wall essentially or another step in the process so how do you think in the future what is the trend um, tell me what is the trend where everything goes uh, like um, is it uh, is it likely that we will see more and more people going into crypto into let's say MSBs uh, uh, you know all these organizations that are not really banks uh, entities that are working on the banks bank license uh, and basically this means that the whole economy the whole financial essential financial system will be going out of banks uh, uh, in general as such. I'm a moderate. <laughs> uh, it's not. It doesn't make for um, a sexy opinion, but I think I'm. I'm probably going to be proven right over the course of time. So, I don't think crypto is going anywhere, and I think that as mature businesses enter the space. Um, it's really captured hearts and minds. People really care about crypto and I don't think it's going away. By the same token, I don't see banks failing en masse as well. Like some, some people will catastrophize either way and say crypto is gonna completely fail. That may be the case, but I don't believe it to be the case. Uh, and others will say, well, no, fintechs are the future and, and um, banks are gonna completely fail. They're, no one's gonna stick around with banks. Uh, if that was the case, we would have seen it already. <laughs> um, I, I think that it's more an amalgamation and we're going to see more um, cooperation between these industries. And, and essentially, in Australia, especially, we're, we're lucky. We have quite good banks that with quite good digital offerings and, and quite good capabilities. We've seen it with the buy now, pay later, for instance, uh, industry. is Initially, it was very disruptive. But now I think two of the four Australian big banks have their own buy now, pay later, potentially three. Um, and and it's, it's, they innovate and, and adapt and uh, acquire. And <laughs> so, so I don't think that it's going to be either way. I think it's going to be more of an amalgamation, especially in uncertain times like we're experiencing now. Um, some fintechs valuations are being slashed. So it would be an attractive time for banks to pick up a bargain and uh, incorporate that into their product offering. Will this bring banks to, to, to more attention towards uh, uh, towards technologies that uh, crypto businesses and uh, businesses like yours um, are now implementing and now are using? Yeah, I think so. Um, I think that crypto is not going anywhere. While there's a strong demand and a strong consumer sentiment about it, even when there's like, I, I've, no one ever sort of comes up to you on the street and wants to talk about their really exciting credit card, right? Or their term deposit or their home loan. These are things that only real payments nerds discuss. But crypto is more than that because it's captured a whole generation, you could say. Um, I've, I've never had so many people want to talk about a financial product at its, at its heart. So I think that the banks uh, would be foolish to long term um, avoid this and I've got to say as, as much as a lot of crypto people like to paint the banks as foolish I don't think they are <laughs> I think they're actually quite good so uh, I see them moving towards adoption um, rather than rather than hoping that it fizzles out because I think the time for it to have fizzled out has passed and so first you fight it you know but uh, but but that that stage is kind of passing and I think that we're gonna see some adoption um, in fact one of our largest banks uh, did announce 
um, you know, a partnership with a crypto firm and was was going to start offering crypto uh, investment services to, to clients. Um, that was the Com Commonwealth Bank. They announced that last year. And so where, where one goes, others will follow is my, my kind of gut feel. So, so what you're saying is that uh, crypto is not going anywhere, but it will it is gonna change the whole international financial system. Just that, <laughs> not more, not less. Okay, uh, this was Luke Raven, and um, thank you very much, Luke, for this uh, talk. Thanks for having me, Tony. It's been a pleasure.